Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, um, so yes, this is this is about a very important topic. Um, I'm supposed to say that also on behalf of Eliazar. Um, uh, the point here is that I, I haven't done this. I haven't I haven't um, crafted snake make myself. I also don't consider myself an expert. Uh, even worse. Um, but what I what I can tell you this this stuff is so easy that I mean you, you could give the same talk within in the course of three or four days after practice, practicing uh, snake make a little bit. So that's the good point about it. Yeah. So this is on behalf. I'm doing this also on behalf of my postdoc Johannes Köster who wrote. Uh, snake make um, and after doing this during his PhD studies got hired immediately by the Dana Faber Institute at Harvard uh, for setting up the workflows and after one year he was done after one year he was done and joined my lab uh, and he now wants to go on and, and work it out a little more on this uh, the method part of this and not just setting up the workflows for other people anyway so um, let's get into this um, the, this is the like the internal very old problem. You have a data set to analyze. You have a, a few jobs to run on it, like a red job and some some yellow jobs and another red job. In the end, you have a green job, um, and you want to do this for several data sets at the same time. For example, uh, and then I mean you don't want to let me have a look. You don't you want to get from the raw data to the final figures. And you would like to ensure full reproducibility uh, with everything you're doing. Um, and so you would like to document all the parameters, the tools, and the versions of the tools you're using. Uh, and you would like to execute kind of the whole picture of this without manual intervention, meaning you don't kind of have a return click for each job to execute. You only would like to have a master return click, and you get from up there from the data sets to re results kind of in, in one click. And then um, <clears throat> along the way, the software determines for you which, which of the jobs still have to be executed and how the jobs interact with one another. And you do, do not want to be concerned with this uh, any further. Hmm? So you need a tool that can handle parallelization. If you have several cores, you would like to distribute a job across the cores such that you have a, a quicker execution of the whole workflow. Uh, you would also like to avoid redundancy. So whenever you already have uh, generated a data set, then you would like to avoid to regenerate it again. Uh, so you need some software that determines which are the jobs already done and which are not. Or say which of the jobs were done, but now you have a newer version coming from above and then you have to rerun the job because the, 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 the data set uh, the, the, or the, the, the figure or whatever it is at the, the very end is outdated with respect to the input. Uh, you also would like to have, um, I mean, whenever you have a failure, if whenever, you, when, whenever a job fails, then you would like to re-execute this job also possibly automatically or like say you the software can handle failures in a appropriate way huh? mm -hmm. um, and then you would like to have it documented and what you what you get from the software is that you you basically have a syntax it's it's coding workflows yeah so you write you do not construct the workflows kind of manually or so you write the workflows using uh, the snake max syntax which is based on Python, by the way. Um, and by doing this, after having written this, you're already done documenting it because that's, that's a code. You can re-execute this. You don't need to, to document every step, like in, in formal readmes or something, like uh, ASCII files uh, uh, describing what you did painstakingly. Huh? <coughs> you just write this workflow code, and then you have ensured already that everything is reproducible, uh, and so on. Yeah, so that's that's what it uh, uh, comes with. Yeah, this is this is the goal of this. This is the the major purpose of Snake Maker. That's the paper. It appeared in 2012. Um, well, um, I, I told you I'm not really an expert in this. This this is scheduling software and stuff like this. It's not really my my uh, cup of tea, uh, actually. 
But I, I, what I can claim for myself, I, I've been one of the first users of this already before the, the paper appeared. I, I was using this because I knew Johannes already back then, and we are kind of friends back then already. Um, so Snakemake has a large and constantly growing community. Here on the x-axis, you have the months in 2015. And, and on the y-axis, you have the, by Google Analytics, the determined number of sessions. And it's steadily growing. In 2016, this went on. So um, what I didn't really um, mm, have on my, um, well, I didn't really consider was when I hired Johannes three months ago, I would hire a postdoc who is busy with responding to emails for two hours a day. Uh, like, um, yeah, I have to wait until he's done, until I can work with him. Um, and as you can see already uh, in, in the United States, there is the largest community. Uh, I don't know the exact reason for this. Uh, Johannes from Germany, you see some, some, some darker spot also. Germany is a little darker. But in the United, United States, obviously, people picked up the, the idea of, of doing it like this. Uh, Facet of all. OK, so some, some of the papers where Snakemake was used. Um, the lowermost most one is, is mine. This, this appeared like about the same time when Snakemake appeared. And we were using it and already in the Genome of the Netherlands uh, project where I am a member of. Um, we used it and it helped. I mean, it's a population scale sequencing project. And we used it there. And it made things so much easier, you can hardly imagine how much. Huh? Um, so we even we have way less people than the 1,000 Genomes Project. And I think Snakemake was one of the factors to keep up with the pace, uh, the 1,000 Genomes Project um, uh, yeah, um, uh, put up. Huh? So also in some, some, some more important uh, cancer papers, it was used um, recently. Uh, Ebola, whatever. I mean, it's uh, people notice the the great use of of this. You're one of the users. Yeah. Okay. Okay. W once more. So um, we'd like to what what the uh, what you do now is you define the workflows in terms of rules. So so each of the jobs here, yeah, the yellow jobs, the red jobs, and the green job, uh, they they become rules, yeah, and in form of a special, special but really easy to perceive syntax. Yeah? And this is this is the syntax. You have a red rule, a yellow rule, and a green rule, and you put this into a master file called snake file. You write all your rules and put them into the snake file, and then you can execute the snake file in some sort. I, I tell you in a little more detail um, soon how this works. So um, a rule comes with an easy syntax. You have a rule name, uh, first of all. And you have um, this, this the three major keywords here. It's input, output, shell. Um, if you have, um, you provide the input to the rule. You provide the, the, the output, which is the file that should be generated. And you also provide the command by which you turn the input into the output. Yeah? Here, this is a simple shell command. Um, you just put a string there. Uh, and then when you execute this rule, you and you have some, some special syntax for making use of the input and the output within the shell command, which is the curly bracket syntax here. My command input, which is replaced by the input provided in the, uh, below the input uh, directive. And then this is then uh, filed into the, out, the, the file uh, provided uh, below the output directive. Yeah? So this is the basic syntax. Yeah? Very easy, intuitively really easy. Yeah? This is what you have to write. That's, that's the code, kind of. I mean, there are also many more special features, but all of this is really easy like this. Yeah? yeah. Do you have to have like one input, one output? Can you have multiple outputs? Oh. Like yeah, of course you can have multiple outputs and multiple inputs. Yeah. This is just for the, the, the first basic example, yeah. i show you in a minute how this works. Um, and you can also generalize here. Well, here you had like really, you provided the, the data sets by their hard names. But you can also make use of wildcards. This is also, uh, uh, this may be the most important feature, because it helps you. you. You can generalize the rules. 
so as to apply them for, for several different data sets. Um, so if you then uh, would like to have as output a file named result slash a dot text generated, then the rule would recognize that this file could be generated by the, by the rule and then replaces data set in curly brackets by A. And then the wildcard data set is then passed on to the input where it is needed. And then data set in curly brackets is replaced by A. And then the shell command runs my command path to a.text and puts this into file result slash a.text. Yeah? So this is the way how you make use of wildcards. The wildcards wild are determined by uh, uh, by, by, the out, by the output directive. Yeah? Everything you put there into curly in curly brackets is a wildcard. And you can make use of this within the other directives. <clears throat> you can also run Python scripts. I'm, I'm not really, I've never done this myself, but you can also, Python now provides some special uh, uh, snake make syntax, uh, a package where you can make use of the wildcards within ordinary Python code. Uh, I have no further examples on this. You, also, can, you can also do this in, within R scripts, um, just to let you know this. Um, and then, well, what is it? Yeah, and then you can, of course, have several rules all within one snake file. And you can have rules that depend on the other ones. Well, for example, here, so this is, this is the first example where you have multiple input data sets, yeah? And then you would like to aggregate those. And then if you would like to generate in rule aggregate the plot slash myplot.pdf, yeah, then snakemake looks up whether the input already exists. And if it doesn't, then it recursively looks, looks for the rule to generate the input as output. And then you see rule my task has uh, has the input needed in aggregate as output. And then it first executes my task and then executes aggregate. And all you have to do is typing, typing snake make, please, please give me the plot slash my plot dot PDF, the exact syntax I will show you in a minute. <clears throat> so here the dependencies are determined automatically. You, you execute, okay, two times for data set one and for data set two, you generate this as output in rule my task and then you use it in rule aggregate as input and then generate the plot. And overall what you get is kind of that each rule becomes a node uh, in a directed ASIC graph uh, where each of the rules kind of represents a job uh, and then snake make determines the dependencies for you and then kind of constructs this directed acyclic graph and then studies the graph uh, so as to uh, kind of execute the jobs in the right order and also distribute the, the load of the jobs uh, on the resources given or whatever else you have to do. Here's a bio example. Um, okay, so you put this, this is also how you execute the workflow on the command line. Yeah? For, for example, you have one rule you put this into the snake file, it's rule BWA map. As input, it needs a, a reference genome, which is genome.fa, a faster file. And you also need a, you need some read, uh, read data provided as a fast Q file, and the output is a BAM file. Yeah? And then what you want to do is kind of you want to map the, the fast Q reads against the reference genome, and then have them as, out, as a BAM file as output. And this is the command here which is possibly a very well-known command to, to many, many of you. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, is this run on your local computer, or do you submit these files to uh, HPC cluster, or where, where do you issue these commands? You, you issue these the commands on your local computer. If you would like to distribute this to a cluster, you can also run SnakeMake on clusters. I, I can show you in a minute how this works, yeah? Uh, but it, it basically it, gen, it works uh, generically on every workstation, whatever you have, laptop, cluster. Huh? It doesn't work yet on, uh, if you have jobs you would, would like to take them to the cloud, it doesn't work yet. This is like the project or Johannes currently. Yeah? It, it, it's soon to come. Hmm? Yeah.
Yeah, 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 you can do that as well. Yeah, yeah. Like in, in, a, few, in a few slides, I show you how. Yeah? Okay. Yes, okay, so that's, that's the basic syntax. And then, then once you, on, on the command line, you then type snake make and the file you would like to have generated, um, which is map reads slash a dot bam. And so snake make looks up in the snake file which of the rules is responsible for generating map reads slash a dot bam. And then it finds, okay, this is rule by BWA map because this is just where, yeah, you, you see it here. Um, and then it, it runs the rule, it executes the rule uh, and a drop that comes along with it. And in the end you have generated the file. You can also have dry runs, which then, then snake makes just shows you which jobs have to be run and so on and so forth, depending on which files already have been generated and so on. Um, you can also run with minus p for printing shell commands and several other options. Yeah? Um, once more, wildcards. Here uh, you may want to have a wildcard instead of a.bam, you would put there curly brackets sample, curly brackets dot bam, and then if you then execute snake mag map reads a dot bam map reads b dot bam you would like to have those two files generated as output yeah so multiple output usually you provide on command line and multiple input you can just write into the input uh, there's also a trick how to how to get multiple output uh, uh, I show you um, so then then a um, sample curly brackets is replaced by a and by b and then you, you run the job two times, yeah? On a, a dot fastq and on b dot fastq. We have two rules now. The snake file now contains rule bwa map uh, just shown and you have rule samples to sort and then the input is, is the output of rule bwa map and then if you would like to have snake make sorted reads slash a dot bam then snake make determines is the output of rule sam to sort uh, and then looks, w w looks up what the input is and then sees, okay, this has to be generated by rule BWA map and then runs first BWA map, uh, meaning it runs BWA mem on a.fastq and then, oh, I forgot to insert the wildcard, wildcards into rule BWA map. Anyway, it still works um, and then executes BWA map, executes sam to sort, and then you're done. And it's just one click. Uh, snake make sort read slash a dot bam click. This is like here, how, how can you have multiple input or output files? You just write them all below the directive. Uh, very easy. And then you can refer to the to the single parts of the input or the output by using uh, ordinary Python syntax. For example, if you would like to refer to the first input file, you write uh, curly brackets input of zero, uh, second one is input of one. Yeah? You can refer by the, to the input, input files by, by index. You can also refer by name if you code it like this. You can write input.a or input.b. Input yeah? Um, and uh, if you would like to, uh, if you have like a more complicated job to run and you cannot do this by just providing a shell command, then you can just uh, have run and then below run you can write everything, you, everything in Python you would like to have for generating the output file. Yeah? Below run you, you just, this is ordinary Python code coming and then that's what it has to do to get from input to output. <clears throat> R scripts, I told you before, I think this is now, you, there's, there's some special uh, functionality now in, in R and, and, and Py, Python, such that you can make use of snake make uh, functionalities. In terms of, in Python, it is certain, certain, uh, certain classes of objects uh, and, and so on. I, I haven't used it so far. Okay, you determine the dependencies. Uh, what is it, yeah, I mean, this is just pretty obvious. I mean. You, you provide a target and then uh, snake make looks up the rule and then it recursively determines which jobs to run and so on and so forth. If no target is specified, snake make tries to run the first rule in the snake file. 
And then what is the usual, this is, is a very common trick. The first rule is rule all, and it only, only provides some input. And then, then if you just type snake make, then it goes to rule all, and then looks up what the input to this is. And if the, the input is missing, then it determines which rules can provide the input of rule all as output, and the recursively go down, and so forth and so forth. The order, in terms of the dependencies, the order of the rules within the snake file is not important. You can, you, you can put them any way you like there. Yeah, the first rule is just the one that becomes applied if you just type snake make and click return. Um, so this is also a, a good way to provide multiple output by making use of this trick here, uh, just providing some input. Hmm? OK, um, so when is the job executed? An ex a job is executed if and only if the output file is a target file and does not exist, or if the output file is needed by another executed job, so recursively, and does not exist, or if the input file is newer than the output file, you have to regenerate the output file because it's outdated, outdated um, um, and so on. Everything very logical and natural. Um, um, and this is determined, like, which of the jobs have to be executed is determined by a breadth-first search on a, on a directed acyclic graph of jobs. <clears throat> so you, this is several ways to, to execute a workflow. Uh, I think I told you about many of those. Um, you can look it up maybe also in the, in the documentation. Um, what is maybe interesting is you can print out the DAG if you want uh, by applying the lowermost command, snake make minus minus DAG, uh, and then you pipe it into dot, which generates an SVG of the directed acyclic graph, and you can print it out and have a look and study the graph if you want, like, if you would like to do that. <clears throat> okay, part two, advanced. Um, uh, you have uh, parallelization, for example, or you have like several you have a, a cluster, say, or you have like a, a, a machine that has several cores and you would like to make proper use of the cores. You can just type snake make minus minus cores eight and then the workflow, workflow will be executed um, at, on at most eight cores. Huh? That's the syntax. So you can, uh, if you have 24 cores, you can leave 16 cores to other people or whatever. Um, you can also write like the number of threads a rule should make use of, and you can also provide a possible, a possible amount of resources needed by the rule, which is not really a strict uh, limitation, but this is needed for the scheduler, the DAG-based scheduler as a, uh, a guideline for how to assign jobs to course. Um, so you can then sort execute the sort command by, and you can refer to define thread number by, by writing curly bracket threads uh, and then the usual stuff. Yeah? And how can you make use of the resources uh, thing? Um, you can, okay, you, you, you wrote, you need like um, 100 megabytes of main memory here. I mean, this is like a possibly you need, you need about 100 megabytes of, of main memory here. And then if you, uh, run snake make here snake make the lowermost snake make minus minus course eight and minus minus resources uh, 100, 100 megabytes of main memory yeah so then snake make will run the workflow the whole workflow on at most eight cores and with at most uh, 100 megabytes and then because you specified that the rule sort needed 100 megabytes it will never execute two of these jobs at the same time. Huh? So you can have a little bit of a handle on how to control the, the number of jobs uh, and the resources you have. You can also explicitly prioritize the generation of certain um, files, um, and then the scheduler will determine whether there's some arbitrariness in, in the, the generation of the files, and then prioritize the ones you, you would like to have prioritized. OK, um, the available jobs are scheduled to maximize parallelization, uh, prefer high priority jobs as provided by the priority. I just also priority director, if I didn't show you that in the, in the rules, you can you have a numerical value. You can you write prior, priority colon and then 
a numerical value from one to 100, I think. And, and the higher it is, the, the more, uh, the, the higher priority to, to execute a job. So um, it prefers high priority jobs and then also tries to satisfy the resource, uh, the resource constraints given, uh, either given by you or by, by the machines themselves. Hmm? So this is the, the optimization problem the scheduler solves. Um, it would like to maximize the number of jobs uh, in terms of the priority, the number of descendants of the jobs. The more descendants the job has, the more important it is. So you would like to run it first. And then also the input size of the job. Uh, this is, has to be, this is a little uh, difficult to parse. This has to be uh, read in the lexicographical order, like priority, number of descendants, input size, yeah? And then takes the jobs and, and sorts them according, this, according to this and then takes the, 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 the well, the, the most jobs uh, in terms of the, the high score in terms of this year without uh, violating the resource constraints. Huh? Anyway, you don't have to be bothered with this. Uh, Snake make does it for you. Huh? So. You can also have config files using the YAML, uh, um, what is it, like file format. It's very simple. Uh, it basically just uh, describes, for example, a couple of data sets uh, you would like to get the, the workflow run on. Uh, and then in the rule all, you just uh, input the, basically you input the data sets provided in config files into the into the input and then it runs on all the data sets provided in a config file. Yeah? It runs the rule sort on all the data sets provided in the config file. This is what I'm showing here. Hmm? There's also input functions. Uh, they take, uh, input functions are simple functions. They take, uh, as input, they take all the wildcards provided in the output, under the output directive, as I told you before, and then creates a list of uh, input files. Yeah? And the list of input files is then the input. Uh, how does it work here? For example, here, this is Python code, lambda, a lambda function. So the, the argument are the wildcards provided in the output. So there's only one, one wildcard here. This is wildcards.dataset. And then looks up in the config files, which of the data sets are uh, refers to the wildcard given, and then this will return you the data sets referring to the wildcard, yeah? The function, well, this is just some, some fancy stuff. You actually never made use of input functions myself before. And then also the question about the log files. You can also provide the log directive here, and then pipe everything that's going to the standard error the standard error output is, is going into the log file. Afterwards, you can look up what went wrong or whatever went, what was going on there in the log file provided under the log directive. Huh? This answers the question? Yeah. Okay. And this is cluster execution. So you also don't have to be bothered so much about like uh, writing, uh, providing the right uh, QSUB a command, you, you, Snakemink will do this for you. Just write snakemake minus minus cluster queues up, minus minus jobs 100, and then does everything for you on the cluster and the resources you have there. Uh, I actually, I'm not in, totally familiar with this, but if you're, if you're interested in this, then, then just have a look in the documentation. I think it's really easy. Actually, uh, yeah, I mean, it avoids a lot of problems if you, that you usually have if you want to run jobs and clusters. Huh? DR, okay. Whatever this is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Pardon me? A different scheduler than what you Okay. Um, I don't know. It does. Hmm? You know? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I was assuming, actually. <laughs> so there are many additional features. Um, 
Uh, it scales from workstation to cluster without workflow modification, modularization. I'm just reading off the slide actually. Uh, handling temporary protected files. It records logging information. I think we had this HTML, HTML reports if you want. Uh, and it can also track the tool versions and, and code changes. Uh, I actually do not really know how this works, but yes. Okay, you can do a lot of things. Also, a lot of more beneficial things for you. Uh, it's all, I promise this, without really knowing all the details, I promise it's, it's all very easy. Hmm? Okay, now, um, last but not least, I mean, so, I mean, the goal was actually to, to have it fully reproducible, but what you, what you usually encounter, and um, I, I haven't used Biocondo myself so much. I have used SnakeMake a lot, um, but I haven't used this. This is the latest project of Johannes. Um, it's, it's about a year old or something. I don't really know. But what you usually have, you have a lot of, you have usually, uh, uh, you, oh, well, with SnakeMake, you can run the jobs automatically, everything fine. But what if in the background on the workstations you execute the jobs, the versions of the tools change? Yeah? Then you have to rerun. Well, then, then you, you should be independent of the, the versions of tools in the running in the background because this, this really affects reproducibility, right? Um, so Bioconda offers a solution for this. And if you apply Bioconda in combination with SnakeMake, then you're done with this as well. So this Bioconda, I mean, this is the usual mess you encounter. If you, if you install all the tools you need for the workflow to run, huh? uh, you do, do all of that. Um, you install the packages. Um, I mean, the tools come with, with kind of, uh, well, versions, uh, several versions, whatever there. And then someone in the background, the administrator, changes the versions, and then you, you're totally messed up. Huh? Okay, <clears throat> so what to do? Um, you can try. You, you can make use of Bioconda, um, which tries to standardize bioinformatics software distributions. It started last fall, so this kind of not even a year ago. Uh, well, no, that's not true. It's, it started 2000, fall 2014, I think. Uh, it has in the meantime, it has more than 80 contributors and more than 1,000 packages. I think in the meantime, even more than. Maybe at least, I don't know, 2,000? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so it, it takes care of the versions. Um, and I do not know what this really means, so I stop here and go on. So. Uh, you would like to, I told you, you would like to ensure full reproducibility. Uh, you would like to have the required software installed and independently of, of any kind of system changes in the background or something. Um, and you would like to have the, the, same, the, the, the exact same workflow run against the exact same kind of versions of tools you had at the very, when, when, you, when you originally have a project running in 2014, yeah? And someone asks you, well, I, I need this plot again, and one of the plots got lost, and you would like to reproduce the plot, of course. Uh, then you, you need to run it, uh, you re need to run your workflow against the versions you had installed back in 2014. Yeah? Um, so what can you do? Um, you install Condor, uh, and then you, you, you also provide some channels, and some, 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 some channels are just the software packages in some sort. Uh, you provide depend dependencies, you provide the, the version numbers, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, oops. And then you can integrate this with SnakeMake. I, I can only ask, I have never given a talk about Bioconda before. Um, actually, I used it, I used it once, and it was really, again, it was really easy, but I, I'm not really, I, I know how, what, what I can tell you about SnakeMake, but I do not really know how Bioconda works. Yeah? Um, um, but you can, you can integrate Bioconda with SnakeMake by um, making use of the environment directive. And then you have a, a YAML um, 
a syntax-based um, definition of the environment for, for the jobs to run. Um, and this is kind of refers to the Bioconda environment. So Bioconda basically is just, I mean, what I know is kind of Bioconda gives you a certain space on your, on your workstation where you have all the tools installed in the versions you would like to have them. And then this never changes. And you also specify the versions, everything in the form of these YAML files. And then you, you, you keep those files, yeah? And you, you also keep this local environment, yeah? Um, which is not quite a virtual machine, but it's, it's like a, an isolated environment. You can make use of this whenever you want to make use of this again. Huh? Uh, and then you run the Snakemake um, jobs within this environment. Hmm? And the specification of, of the environment works together with these YAML uh, files. <clears throat> so, so how to make use of Snakemake in, in combination with Bioconda, for example, Solution one, which is the one preferred by Johannes, I'm, I'm supposed to tell you that, um, you have a Git repository, yeah? Where you store the config file, yeah? Which is part of the, um, which is specified within the snake file, yeah? And where the snake, the rules within the snake file refer to, yeah? And you also deposit an environment file in the Git repository, which helps you get set up the, the environment you need for running the workflow. Yeah? And then also you, you, you put all the scripts there in your own code, whatever you have to put there. And last but not least, you put the snake file there. Yeah? And then you, yeah, you, you put this to the Git repository. Yeah. Docker system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could could be right, yeah. Because when you said it freezes your local system and versionizes, versionizes it, to me that rings a bell. It's like, oh, it's not going to get used in Docker, which is great. Um, Possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in simple words, it's just you have a local environment with all, well, you have the user, user bin, whatever, and this is all local. And it makes use of those instead of the, the machine the, the, in the background, the user, user bin, lo, user local bin stuff. Uh, and then you, you save this once and forever. Yeah, that's what it is. And then basically just Bioconda just re, uh, resets the path, the, the, the paths, yeah? Path, the path variable and all the variables to, to your local environment. Once you, this is, this is done by source activate my workflow, then, re, then sets the path to the to the folders uh, within the local environment, and then everything, then you can run the snake, the, the snake file jobs within the local environment, yeah? Okay, then you, you clone the repository, uh, you, you may add it, the config file, whatever you have. You, you create conda env for environment, create, you cre cre create the, the environment by one command. And the environment gets set up by itself by making use of the specification uh, um, uh, deposited within the environment.yml. Yeah? This is also only one click command. Yeah? You get the environment, then you activate it, and then you run the workflow. Yeah, how easy is that? <laughs> Solution two, well, I think I'm done here. Um, uh, maybe. There's also other solutions, but I, I'm supposed to tell you about the first solution as the preferred solution of Johannes himself. He, he gave this a long, long thoughts. Uh, what's the second solution about? Um, yeah, well, this is a little more naive. Yeah? Um, you just you create the environment and you copy a snake file into the environment and you don't make use of any Git files, uh, Git repositories. So. Uh, this is a more naive uh, approach to using Bicon in combination with Snakemake. Um, you also... Ah, mm -hmm. Of course, you can only... Well, this is, this is again, more naive. You, you just copy the, the config file into... Um, how is this? 
Actually, I don't know what this is, to be honest. There's my workflow run with some Bioconda specific <laughs> syntax. Sorry about this. I told you, I'm not an expert. I think I'm done here. Um, conclusion, Snake make ensures reproducibility, reproducibility and scalability via formalization, documentation, parallelization, and, and the fun, yeah? Um, also for me as a PI who, who was supposed to not code anymore so much, <laughs> but I couldn't stop uh, um, because this now everything is so easy and you, you don't have to care about documenting your code and so on. It's, it's just, you get it all for free. Um, document the workflow, I mean. And Bioconda is a distribution of bioinformatics software with which you can set up environments within which you can run your workflows. Um, and combined, they enable fully reproducible data analysis. Yeah. And that's the final sentence of the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>